with the rapid fire round the first question is at what age do you want to retire now <laughs> how long does it take you to get ready in the mornings um half an hour most embarrassing moment of your life oh my god test <laughs> favorite color red of course what time of day are you most inspired at night late night mm -hmm. basically how many hours of sleep can you survive on? Well, it depends on the number of days. So if it is one day, I can survive without any sleep. If it is for one week, I need to have at least four hours. Fill in the blank. An upcoming technology trend is blank. Data monetization. The city in which the best kiss of your life happened. Lisbon, for sure. <laughs> Pick one, Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Musk. The biggest mistake of your career? Um, go, going into technology. <laughs> How do you relax? Uh, I do yoga. How many cups of coffee do you drink per day? Well, depends on the days, but I would say four or five. A habit of yours that you hate? Um, habit of, I pass. <laughs> the most valuable skill you've learned in life? Uh, love. Your favorite Netflix show? Well, The Crown, I would say. One word description of your leadership style? Um, motherhood. Top priority in your daily schedule? My, my kids, I would say, yeah. Ideal vacation spot? Oh, that's easy. Uh, <laughs> this an Iceland with no Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> Key factor for maintaining a work-life balance? Um, basically, uh, get along with your priorities. Memorable career milestone. Surviving till today. <laughs> the last song you've been listening to. Yes, I don't remember. The last film that you saw that you that had had a good impression on you. Uh, the last film I saw, The Mafia of Pain. I don't know if that's the English name, but that was the one on Pain Killers in the States. So. All right. So that's the end of the rapid fire. Okay. We'll move on to the longer questions now with Michael. Right. No, we're uh, very glad today to, to welcome uh, Falda Avas Dias, uh, head of large business in the public sector for Vodafone uh, Portugal. Uh, quite often with these uh, uh, podcasts, we like to ask the person about the, their background, what it was in their background that, that led them to the job they have now. But I think here, here for once, we have an industry veteran where that's uh, not even relevant. I've been, been in the telecom industry quite a while, I, I understand. Uh, but uh, you, again, latest uh, post, head of large business in public sector. What does that entail? What are your duties there for Vodafone Portugal? Hi, Michael. So uh, it's, you're absolutely right. I'm working in telecommunication since 1996, so since last century, actually. So a long career on that. And this is my last position as head of a large corporation and public sector is basically a segment uh, area. So I have the marketing and commercial area for those two segments. So both for the large corporations in Portugal and the public sector, the entire public sector. So I coordinate a, um, an area of around 80 people. The majority of them are um, commercial, com a commercial team. Okay. So sales, sales reps. Okay. But it's interesting that they, they put together in large business and public sector. You know, that is private and public. Yeah. But is there an commonality or is it not all that too much different to, to be able to be handled in that way? Well, it depends on what you're talking about. So if, so if you're talking about the traditional telecommunications so connectivity, it's very similar. When you're going to the new, the new lines like IoT and, um, you know, even big data or analytics, that's completely different, the approach that we have in, the, in those two segments. So it actually depends on the portfolio that you're addressing. Okay. So you just said with the more advanced technology, you have to take a, a different approach for the two sectors. Uh, can you give us some insight? W what is the difference uh, in, in how you have to approach, you know, public versus private? We're trying to push the, the latest uh, technology. Let me give you a, a very quick example. So uh, when you're talking about um, IoT, for instance, uh, when you're in the public sector, we are very focused on the cities. 
um, water management, uh, smart lighting, you know, these kind of solutions that, of course, bring uh, uh, the sustainability topic to the to the table and that uh, will increase, you know, uh, the population's uh, quality of life. Uh, I, for instance, I don't know if you are aware, in Portugal, we are losing one Olympic pool of clean water every minute. So these kind of solutions really are important for the society, the cities, and the communities. When you're talking about corporations, uh, these kind of solutions are more focused on the efficiency, right? So it's like an industrial uh, company wants to gather information about the machine process, the production processes, understand what they are um, doing right and what they are, can do better and uh, improve that uh, informa we use that information to improve the, the process and efficiency. So that's basically it. So two different approaches and the same product, but that's how the segments work. Okay. And uh, interesting, the efficiency with the uh, public companies or with the private large companies, and that's uh, undoubtedly very viable, although it seems uh, maybe not so exciting to write home about, uh, at least compared to what I've heard of some of the uh, data analytics that you've done uh, in a public uh, sense, uh, doing some very interesting analytics for various public, uh, from cities and other public authorities at major rock concerts, major events. Uh, could you give us some examples of that? There was the, the World Youth Day, for example, uh, this last year. Yes. So uh, on, on the public segment, we did the last one. The last big one that we did was exactly the World Youth Day that happened in Lisbon, now in August, back in August. We had 1.5 million visitors in Lisbon, which is a city where in the city center uh, live around half a million people. So we multiplied by four the number of people in the, in the city during that week. Um, and basically what we did was we analyzed people's flows within that week and we learned a lot of interesting things like people even living in Lisbon left the city, 10%, uh, left the city before the event began and they only came back when it ended. So they escaped from the, all the, the fuzz that was going around. We also learned that uh, the Spanish and the Italians were the first ones to arrive. They wanted to get to the party early. And we actually saw the flows of the people, the movements uh, they were doing during that week from event to event, where they were staying, where they were sleeping and so on. And we were, with that information, we were able to not only um, provide them a better service for, for our own shops, for instance, or even our network resilience, but also we, we fed that information into Lisbon City Hall so they could use it uh, regarding the logistic processes and security, public transportation movements, and so on. So it was the the last the latest big one that we did. But we do a lot of those um, of those analyses to to the government or to the public uh, sector. One that I that I like a lot is a project that we have done um, with the um, fire department in the Algarve. So the wildfires are something that unfortunately happen in Portugal every year. And what we did was the fire department defined the fire area and we were able to provide them the information or fed them the information on how many people were in there and out of the, that area. So they would take a decision immediately on reinforcing the firefighters in that area or not. So this is the case of... Um, is an example how we can use the information and the data uh, and basically turn the data into information and we can act upon it because it's almost real time and that's a big difference. So we do believe that uh, this area, this um, stream, it's going to be of um, a major necessity from now on. So let's see. Uh, you're saying even you've, you've made it a major necessity, necessity perhaps now, now that Lisbon knows that's possible, that they can now not imagine doing without for future such events, possibly. Okay. Well, um, you were talking about that data analysis for the uh, the companies and then for the wildfires and then the uh, rock concerts of the World Youth Day, and in particular for the latter. Um, we're talking about human data there where a person's activities, and so that, you know, that raises the issue of just what you do with it, what you do to establish privacy. Now, of course, under the EU, you have the GDPR battling various privacy elements. So how do you handle that issue to reassure people that their privacy is retained? So uh, privacy for us is mandatory, okay? So we don't 
play around with that. Uh, we, when we treat all the data that we gather from our um, base stations, uh, we do uh, um, a work to anonymize and aggregate it. And we, we do it in such a way that it is impossible to return and to go back to individual data. To give you a, uh, an example that is easy to, to comprehend, uh, if we have um, like five registrations in one BTS, we are going to erase that information because it's too close to the individual so you can trace back to the person. So what we do is we have minimum amounts of thresholds where below that we don't analyze the data. We do, the, of course, the statistical speculation of that, but we don't look at it. So we, we are very, very um, keen on uh, uh, being compliant with the, all the GDPR regulations, of course, that we don't joke on service on that. And we even got an honorable mention on the work that we are doing here from the Association for Data Privacy. So that's something we are very proud of because, of course, we uh, understand the potential of the use of this information, but we totally respect the individuality and the privacy of the people. So basically, that's how we do it, Michael. Well, no, sounds good. And I'm wondering, though, at, 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 at the, the industry level, the, the Portugal telecom industry, you, obviously, you have other competitors. Uh, what's your industry-wide assessment about treatment of privacy? Are, are you ahead of the curve, or, or hopefully at least your competitors have some minimal amount of respect as well for that? Well, I, I'd like to hope so, and I'd like to think so. Uh, I cannot vouch for, for their work, of course, but from, from Vodafone Portugal, it's totally inside our, our culture, and we do respect it a lot, both internally, but with our partners also that work with us. We, that's something that we take very seriously, not only in product by design, you know, we use that in the product design, we use that in training for the team. So it's something that we are always um, taking care of because of course it is a hot topic in the, in the industry and not only, and we, we would like to be known as the most respectful ones on, on that area. Sure. Well, yeah, a related subject uh, with the sort of, especially data crowd that you provide is, is cybersecurity, uh, keeping people from getting viruses, from getting hacked, and that sort of thing. Uh, that's something you'll have to do as well. Customers will demand it. But what is Vodafone from Portugal's commitment and actual active measures to provide a healthy level of cybersecurity to its customer? So, Michael, I don't know if you are aware, Vodafone Portugal itself was a victim of a massive cyber attack last year. So we know in first hand what is going through that experience. So not only on that, um, but of course we have the industry trend and we have the, all the spectrum of the uh, cybersecurity uh, portfolio to our customers, okay? So we start in the identification of the risks. We have all the, um, the, um, the products to protect uh, your, the businesses. And we also have, after the protection, if there's an intrusion, we have uh, uh, also detection and then the response. Okay, so we have, we go end to end on that. Some of the services are in-house, some of the services are through partnerships, uh, but basically we would like to provide in that area an end to end offering to our customers. Uh, let me give you a quick example. So one of the things that we just um, worked on last year or this year was uh, the anti-smishing uh, service that is a service that identifies the uh, smishing through SMS, okay? So that is a trend that is growing a lot in Portugal. Oh, smishing. Oh, so yeah. fish, phishing via SMS. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what okay. that is, right. So you get an SMS with a link, and if you click it, they try, try to capture your data. So that's something that is happening a lot in Portugal, is growing a lot. And we developed an in-house services that blocks that, uh, that um, access. Uh, so we can protect uh, the con the final consumers, basically, but also our uh, businesses that are our customers, because usually those SMSs go in on behalf of our uh, um, of a retailer that is well known or something like that. So this is the kind we have to you know you, we have to be always on top because cybersecurity is it's the fastest growing industry in the world, I would say. Uh, I, I thought um, uh, a study the other day that said if cybercrime was a, a country, it will be in the top five countries, richest countries of the world. So you see, so that's an, an area that, of course, we work a lot on. 
So cyber cybersecurity is one of the areas that is, uh, of course, uh, one one of the pillars of our uh, portfolio. But we'll keep on working on it because it's continuing to grow, and we have to be there for it. And actually, we do think that uh, you know tools like artificial intelligence and uh, AI generation will be helpful. Not it will be, of course, also a threat because this will be used by the cyber crime, but it's also um, an opportunity to use it in defense. So it's definitely an area of future. Right. Well, you know, one uh, particular reason to take a cyber security very seriously. Uh, Apart from everything else, of course, our recent trends, which we're all familiar with uh, concerning remote work, you know, kicked off by the COVID epidemic, everyone for health reasons needed to work outside the office much more. And uh, you're aware that in many cases that stuck even as the disease threat has gone away. More people are working remotely and that poses various new telecom challenges. I wanted to ask you about how Vodafone in Portugal has, uh, what changes you've seen and how they you've dealt with uh, accommodating your customers with this new phase of services you need to provide. Let me just start off with an example. When COVID struck uh, in three days, we had to put our entire call center from the offices into the people's houses, okay? And this is more than 1,000 people. So this uh, demands uh, highly the uh, connectivity that works, basically. So I would say um, connectivity and 5G will play a major importance in that. So you don't have an office anymore. Actually, we do have offices, but the office now is extended, you know, to the people's houses, as you're saying. And we do believe that uh, the 5G will bring, um, the, I would say, the removal of geographical barriers. I think that's the main the main point that and the main game changer that 5G is bringing. And this answers uh, completely to your question, right? So if you have a, a connectivity that reaches everywhere uh, that you can work as if you were in the office, if, as, you, as if you had a fiber connection, then basically you are in the same space and you can do exactly the same things that you were in the office. So I do think that COVID brought, brought that to light, but technology already had the answer. Okay. Because at least for your initial example, of course, that was internal. It was how you internally had to make changes to do it, but uh, surely also externally in terms of the services you can provide to other customers yes. gives them the, uh, similar capabilities to do the same thing or any variation that they like. Exactly. So basically, when uh, to, for you to know, Michael, when COVID uh, came, struck, um, I was working 20 hours a day because our customers were doing that exact same exercise, right? So they were moving from their offices and spreading everyone on their on their own homes. And uh, be, they had to have connectivity, they have to have VPNs access, they have to have firewalls in place. So that was a lot of work, but I think now today is the new normal, basically. Right, okay. What we could call more sort of ESG type topics, there's a special one I wanted to uh, mention uh, to you in the Portuguese context, possibly. Uh, you know, the uh, bridging the digital divide, of course, where there is uh, some societal chasm between those on one side who have f full access to and capability in the latest technologies and those on the other who are left behind don't have access to it. Uh, what, if anything, is Vodafone Portugal doing within Portugal to ease the digital divide and bring people you know, into the modern world so they too can take advantage of it for employment and, and all, all that sort of stuff? Okay, so first of all, I would say the all investments that we are doing in our network to cover the country have, and having no gray areas on the on the connectivity, as we are just saying, uh, that's the number one. I would say because you have to have give access for people to the you know to the digital world. So that will be the number one. I'll say the basic one. Again, I do think that five G will bring uh, it's a game changer on this area because it will bring connectivity connectivity at high level speed where you once didn't didn't have, you know, fiber connection or fixed connection. So that will cover some gaps that the uh, technology and the networks didn't have. And I think that will be, I would say, the number one thing that we are doing. But also we do uh, act as a purpose, with a purpose, okay? So what we do is we do have programs to help inclusion and digital inclusion, for instance, to kick off, I would say, one that I really like is our Vodafone Power Lab. Power Lab is a project that we have that 
we support startups in the technology world to bring and bring them to the market. Okay, so we act as mentors and coaching and so on, and we give them the opportunities on that. So I think that's a way of providing that um, uh, access to to in this case, usually young kids that want to have good ideas, and we we help them to bring them into the market. But we do also have other kinds of programs through the Vodafone Foundation. I, for myself, was volunteer in the Code Like a Girl program. So we were teaching, you know, girls from the from high school to code that is usually something connected with, you know, more male thing. So that was a really, really fun work that that we did. So we have, uh, I would say, a different, a, a, ver a varied, a wide spectrum of uh, um, exercises in that in that topic. Real quick, from what you mentioned, I get the impression that 5G uh, tech has not yet arrived, at least to vote from Portugal or to, or to Portugal at all. It's not yet arrived, yes. 5G is in Portugal. Yes. Right, okay, right. Sorry, I, I, I thought, uh, now, although I, I have here that uh, coming up uh, soon in the future is a so-called 5.5G advanced. That will be 5, 5, what, probably what you're mentioning is the standalone networks, is that it? I don't know. I was researching 5G and heard, hey, coming up, 5.5G, also known as advanced 5G, of course. But I'd like to st still stay on, on ESG-type subjects uh, and go to, of course, uh, you know, sustainability and climate change, because you'd think that a telecom would be fairly clean in terms of what it does, but actually we had an interview yesterday with a, a Polish telecom. You know, it, uh, it depends on where they get their energy from. If it's from fossil fuels, that's not so good. You know, what, what are Vodafone's uh, postures and moves in the climate change and sustainability. I don't know if you are aware, but planet is one of the, our three pillars in the strategy, okay? So really? we, yes, we take it uh, very seriously. Seriously. So we have three pillars, by the way, it's uh, inclusion for all, planet and digital society, okay? So that's what, what we act upon. On planet that you are just mentioning, so in 1st of July, 2021st, uh, the European network for Vodafone was all uh, based on renewable energy, okay? And that is... Oh, well. 100%. 100%, yes. So that's a milestone that we arrived in 2021. And now we have the, the objective of putting all, um, all networks, so this was in Europe, we are putting all network worldwide by 2030, also 100% on, um, on renewal, the renewable energy. We also have the commitment by 2030 again to have all operations uh, ne uh, zero neutral carbon. Okay, so that's a milestone that we are working. And here, here we're talking about sort of Vodafone International. Globally, yeah. Vodafone International, but it sounds like Vodafone Portugal is already is way ahead of the curve. Already 100 percent. Yes, we are. Okay, uh, and that is from the internal perspective. That I think that was your your question. But we also, uh, again, we provide a lot of products to our customers so they themselves can do that path, okay? So things like smart energy um, solutions and um, analytics on the, their spend and so on, we are working on that um, to, to help also the customers to, to reach that, that, those, those kind of milestones in their businesses. And again, this is, this is in Portugal. This is what your company is doing yeah. to aid uh, their... Again, even keeping a step ahead of the global uh, ambitions or objectives of Vodafone International, which is what based in England, I suppose, in the UK or the Vodafone. But uh, okay, not very, very impressive. You know, you were talking about 5G and advanced 5G, and there's Internet of Things, and of course, there's uh, artificial intelligence. Wanted to see if we can uh, have you take a look forward where you think te technology is going and how Vodafone will come along for the ride, take advantage of that to uh, optimize its services even further. Yeah, so, um, Michael, again, um, we are in an area where um, 5G is bringing a speed to things that uh, humans cannot cope with it, okay? Um, one example I always share is uh, the fastest movement a human does is the blink of an eye. And 5G is 10, 10 times faster than that, okay? So we cannot match the velocity. And what we're doing today is and this seems that I'm going off topic, but I'm not. What we've been doing today is we have a lot of data spread around and we capture that data and transform it into, into information. When what we do uh, with that information is we give it to the humans and humans take the decisions upon it, right? So 
the speed that 5G is going to bring to everything is not going to be, you know, uh, it's not going to be uh, um, followed by, by the human velocity. So you're going to need to have artificial intelligence on top of it to replace humans' decision because they're going to be much faster. So once you're thinking about it, the decision is already taken. And that's the way we see things evolving, okay? So that's the way we think uh, the processes are going to move ahead and how digitalization is going to uh, enter the companies and even to the, you know, the government um, the, the government entities will, will also have that the same path. So, of course... This is a, a bit frightening for us because we want to know to see ourselves as you know we are the the most the the fastest and the smartest and everything, uh, and that's totally not true at this point. No, right. Uh, especially with the artificial intelligence, you were mentioning smishing before. One could imagine you know that that could supercharge it, so it gets even easier to fool people and to take advantage of them. You know. But you, you have to wear the, to use the same weapons in reverse, right? So, of course, in the, in the attacks, and going back to that point, cyber attacks will use artificial intelligence. You have to use it to defend it. You have to be quicker. So that's, there's no way around it. Right. And, and you mentioned government uh, influence. What is your assessment? Uh, is the government uh, helpful or over-regulating or supporting financially or in other ways your adoption of, of advanced technology? I have to pass that one, okay? Okay. Uh, understand, all right. Well, and uh, you mentioned also in, in the past partnerships. So, what is your approach to partnerships, especially perhaps in the same topic of advanced technology or otherwise? You know, working with other co companies in a way that you both gain. Uh, any examples of that? Yeah, sure. Uh, even last week, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, our CEO Margarita de la Valle announced a partnership that we uh, did with Accenture on managed services. So, we have partnerships uh, all throughout the, the company. Uh, on a strategic level, but also in an operational level. So we are very much focused on our customers and we like to deliver, you know, end-to-end -end solutions to their problems. Uh, so that sometimes means going out to a partnership and getting along with a partner to answer to the customer's needs. We don't have everything in-house. It's impossible to have all the innovation in the technology market in-house. So we we like to do it well. It doesn't mean we need to do it whole in-house, so we do we'll use partnerships very often. Okay, it sounds like there's a, a set amount of, of experience and even a protocol within your company for approaching and engaging in partnerships in a, in a mutually beneficial way with other uh, companies that com you can work well with. Yes. Right, so the last question for you is of a personal client. What would you be doing in your life if not this right now? I will be retiring in the beach, but drinking margaritas. 